fire slip the surly bonds of earth and dance the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheels and sword and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept height with easy grace. Where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silence, lifting mind, I prod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. And welcome to the third installment of The Dat Project. Great to see you and glad to have you back. In this installment, we have Ensign, not Lieutenant J.G. Purvis, my mistake, having received his wings at Pensacola and then receiving his orders to proceed to Kingsville, Texas for further flight training, where he will train to fly the Grumman S2F Tracker. But first, a quick diversion into the pre-1962 military naming conventions for aircraft, in particular the Navy's. As I said, my father would be training in a Grumman S2F tracker. By today's naming conventions, you would think that if he were flying the S2F, he would be flying the F model of the S2, the two denoting the second anti-submarine aircraft in the Navy, and that the S stood for submarine, but you would be wrong. To fully explain the arcane Navy aircraft designators pre-1962 would be a loser's game. So a quick translation of S2F. The S stood for, stood for Scout. The 2 was the second Grumman-made Scout plane, while the F stood for Grumman, G having been used for Goodyear, and to add to the confusion, the AGA Aviation Corporation that built gliders. And indeed, Grumman had built a Scout plane before the S2F, and that would be the S1F, of which 33 were made. In 1962, a former Ford executive, Robert McNamara, who found himself elevated to the position of Secretary of Defense by President Kennedy, was having difficulty discerning the difference between the Navy's F-4H Phantom and the Air Force's F-110 Spectre. His confusion would lead to the 1962 Tri-Service Aircraft Designation System that is currently used. This system has its own anomalies, but for the most part is very straightforward and easy to understand. So my dad would be flying the S2F-1 while in training and in squadron as denoted in his logbooks and then magically in December of 1962 he would begin flying the S2S. In any case, I did ask my dad why he chose, and I say chose in quotation marks, a multi-engine submarine patrol aircraft versus the much sexier jet fighter types. Well, he said, I figured since I wanted to be a pilot and fly, why not fly a plane that flies a lot? I didn't push him any further, but if the military is anything, it's a meritocracy. You are constantly graded on your performance and your fitness report. FitRep follows you throughout your career. As a pilot, every mile post in your training is graded, and once in the fleet, every aspect of your flight performance is graded. As a carrier pilot, every landing is graded, and enough low scores can end your flight career. So in the training regimen, the student with the best cumulative score gets first choice in type. Typically, you would fill out a sheet with your top three choices, but this is also where the term needs of the Navy may rear its ugly head. Meaning, the first several pilots of a training section may get the type they want, while the rest get a type that needs bodies, according to the needs of the Navy. Long story short, the S2F is not a sexy beast and not the jet fighter that later trainees dreamed of after seeing Top Gun. So did my father choose the S2F, or was he so far down the list it was the only thing left, or did the needs of the Navy choose it for him? Based on his later flying arc, I don't think so. I don't think so far down the list was a reason. In any case, let's take another diversion and talk about submarines. While any number of inventors dreamed of flying like the birds, there were also those that dreamed of swimming like the fishes. And like any innocent dream of invention, it was quickly overtaken by those who figured there had to be a way to use that invention to destroy their enemies. 
Now, skipping over years of incremental invention, we'll go directly to the first recorded use of a combat submarine to sink a surface ship. That would be the Confederate state ship Hunley that attacked the USS Housatonic that was part of the Union blockade of Charleston. Armed with a spar torpedo, a charge that was extended on a pole attached to the Hunley, the human-powered Hunley came close enough to detonate the charge that sunk the Housatonic, but it was later found that the charge also sunk the Hunley. It would be World War I that would introduce the general public to the rise of the submarine, particularly the German U-boats and the German neighbors, Navy's Unterwasser fleet's most famous and notorious sinking of the HMS Lusitania by the U-20. That sinking was a propaganda gold mine for the British, who claimed the ship was an innocent passenger liner plying its trade, while the Germans claimed they had intelligence that the ship was loaded to the gills with munitions. This argument continues to this day. It would be the rise of the German U-boat wolf packs in World War II that would again introduce the general public to the dangers of the submarine. Initially, the U-boats had the upper hand in what later would be called the Battle of the Atlantic that stretched from 1939 to the very end of the war in 1945. That advantage would be lost when the British successfully broke the mechanical workings of the Enigma cipher machine that allowed the Allies to read the Enigma traffic sent to the U-boats, giving the Allies locations and plans for the disbursement of the U-boat fleets. Of course, it wasn't just the cracking of the Enigma cipher machine, but several advancements in radar, sonar, and other means to detect submarines submerged and running on the surface that were continually being perfected and given a platform for their use that would hearken the end of the dominance of the U-boat. During World War II, it would be the PBY Catalina that was used most extensively for anti-submarine warfare and was one of the first aircraft to use a magnetic anomaly detector, better known as a MAD system, to hunt for submarines. These systems compared the Earth's magnetic signature with the metal of a ship or submarine that have their own magnetic signatures to find them and is still used today. Now, the Navy's problem was how to load all the various anti-submarine warfare systems on a platform that would fit easily on the deck of a carrier. The Catalina was a non-starter as it was a large seaplane. Soon after the war, these various systems were still too large to fit into one aircraft that would then fit on the deck of a carrier. The initial solution was a hunter-killer arrangement. By taking the well-used and familiar Grumman TBF airframe, the Navy was able to fit various anti-submarine detecting devices in a single TBF airframe, the TBM-3W2 being the hunter and the TBM-3S2 loaded with munitions being the killer. It would be a circuitous route to the follow-on hunter-killer ASW aircraft, the Grumman AF-2 Guardian, and a short circuit to the S2F. With the exigencies of war, a replacement for the Avenger was almost immediately planned for. Grumman proposed their Model G-55, a twin-engine torpedo bomber that proved too large for the existing carriers, so it only made it to the mock-up stage. With a need for a replacement for the Avenger in his torpedo bomber role still required during the war, Grumman proposed the G-70, the Guardian, as its replacement. But, with the war in its waning days and the realization that the Navy would need a dedicated ASW platform for its carriers, the Navy asked Grumman to modify the Guardian for this purpose. And soon, the Guardian would be dubbed the AF-2S and AF-2W in a hunter-killer configuration. As mentioned earlier, a modified TBM Avenger was used as a stopgap solution in the hunter-killer role until the Guardian could come online. Although first flown in 1945 with the Navy's new requirement to morph it into an ASW hunter-killer platform, it wouldn't be until 1950 that it was introduced to the fleet and a total of 387 Guardians of both models were built. Operationally, the hunter-killer approach proved to be less than ideal. The coordination of the pair was difficult and problematic. Also, if either hunter or killer aircraft had to abort a mission for any reason, both aircraft would return to base. As mentioned earlier, the hunter-killer solution was initially deemed necessary based on carrier size and the size of the ASW detecting equipment and armament. But as larger carriers came online, this would no longer be a problem. So again, the call went out for a dedicated ASW aircraft that would fit all the necessary equipment and armament into one airframe. 
Grumman proposed their Model G89 platform, and even to the untrained eye, it was at least a fraternal twin to the Model G55 that Grumman had proposed in World War II as a torpedo bomber. On June 30, 1950, two prototypes and 15 S2F-1 production aircraft were ordered at the same time. The first flight was on December 4, 1952, and the squadron BS-26 would introduce the tractor to the fleet. By the time my father took his first flight in the tractor on August 5, 1958, it was still a relatively new airframe and a very capable ASW platform that could carry two aerial torpedoes or one nuclear depth charge in its internal torpedo bay. It had six underwing hardpoints for rocket pods, depth chargers, or up to four additional torpedoes. A ventrally mounted retractable radome, an extendable magnetic anomaly detector, a diesel exhaust particulate sniffer, and a 70 million cattle power, power searchlight. Additionally, the rear of the engine nacelles carried up to 16 sonoboys. All of this was controlled by a four-man crew consisting of the pilot, co-pilot navigator, radio man who doubles as a mad gear operator, and the radar man who also operates the sonar gear. Grumman produced 1,185 of these weepies dies in a production run that would last until 1968 and see it enter the inventories of 16 air forces. Its replacement, the Lockheed S3 Viking, would only see a production run of 188 units, but by the time the S3 was introduced, anti-submarine warfare had changed considerably. On August 15, 1958, my father took his first flight in the S2F-1 for a one-and-a-half-hour orientation flight. This was the first flight that would lead to 1,606 hours of total time in the S2. At the time of that flight, U.S. Naval Intelligence reported that the Soviet submarine fleet had peaked at 450 active units in 1957. After the fall of the Soviet Union, it was reported that the Soviet Union, Union had produced 727 subs between 1945 and 1991, of which 492 were diesel electric and 235 were nuclear. With a metallurgy of capability second to none, the Soviets were able to produce the largest submarine ever built, the Typhoon class, the fastest attack submarine ever built, the Alpha class, and the deepest diving sub ever built, the Mike class. The Soviet submarine force was very capable and very dangerous. So, in January of 1959, having completed his time as a student naval aviator in the Naval Air Training Command, he reported to Quonset Point, Rhode Island, to join one arm of the Anti-Submarine Warfare Force of the Navy, Air Anti-Submarine Squadron 32, and their target would be the dangerous and capable Soviet submarine fleet. So next time, Naval Aviator Lieutenant J.G. Purvis, Academy Class of 1957, will proceed to Rhode Island to begin his time in the fleet as an F-2F-1 pilot stationed out of Quonset Point, Rhode Island. He would continue to hone his skills along with his crew to detect and, if necessary, to sink enemy submarines. He would soon ship out on his first cruise aboard the U.S. Navy's last straight deck carrier, the USS Lake Champlain CV-39. In any case, thanks for joining me for the third installment of the DAD project. I'm still not selling anything or giving any instruction on how to do anything. I'm trying to tell a story I was hoping my father would tell me, and now I'm trying to tell it for him. So please subscribe if you'd like to hear more. And until next time, thanks for watching. Enjoy what life has given you. Ciao.